uh, mission. And uh, today, the event is to share this uh, group to share their own day talk. And, uh, and uh, of course, as usual, the video of the roundtable will be on our website, as uh, also the roundtable of uh, Professor Lee. Thank you, Salvatore. Thank you, and for this very nice presentation. So first, I'd like to thank Salvatore and Emna for trusting me, for entrusting me this very important uh, event. Um, well, as you see, we could not find the round table, so uh, the speakers are, are <laughs> yeah, in sitting. Uh, so you will find them. In, uh, I, uh, I regard it as a great honor that uh, I or organized this. Um, uh, round table uh, for Witt Clemens and I also thank uh, Thea Tichy, uh, the Greek goddess of, uh, of randomness <laughs> for this and uh, of course I thank you all for coming in this event um, we have uh, four speakers but it is informal anyway so everybody who wants to contribute uh, he may feel free at any time or to interrupt us or uh, after the talks to uh, make an additional contribution. So we have uh, Gordon Young, you know, president of IAS. Then we have Henny Collen Brother, who was secretary general at the time that Witt Clemens was the president of uh, IAS in the 80s. And uh, we have also Alberto Mondanari from the younger generation. So, uh, Gordon, could you start this uh, series of talks? Well, thank you very much, uh, Dimitris, and of course, I'm absolutely delighted to be here and honoured to be able to give a few thoughts, reminiscences about um, life with Vit, Vit Clemish, um, who we all regard as somebody very, very special, uh, not only as a, as a hydrologist, but also a, as a person. Um, I'll start off uh, in agreement with... Um, Demetrius with a very short uh, biography. Uh, where are we? Um, <clears throat> born in the then uh, Czechoslovakia, in the uh, Czech uh, part of uh, what was Czechoslovakia, <clears throat> and he had his education uh, in civil engineering and then uh, the equivalent of a, a PhD. I'm not sure what CSC stands for. Do you know what that is, Demetrius? CSC, anyway, it's equivalent to, to a PhD, <coughs> and then a DSC from the Czech Technical uh, University. <coughs> and um, in 1968, at the age of uh, 36, uh, he came to Canada, but he was already well established. Uh, he had written some important papers before even uh, coming to Canada at that uh, early age. And uh, <clears throat> he immediately went to uh, the University of Toronto as, as an associate professor. And um, I never really understood why, why he left the university uh, atmosphere, because he, was very, he would have been extremely suited as, a, a, as an academic. But <clears throat> whatever the reason, he joined um, Environment Canada, uh, the federal government, in, um, in um, 1972. And in fact, that was the year when I also uh, joined uh, the same department, and uh, we were on the same floor as each other. Of course, at that time, I really didn't know him very well, and he, he was still up and coming. He hadn't written many of his uh, seminal papers. <coughs> but um, actually, 1972 was an interesting time in environment, because there had just been the big um, Stockholm 
conference on uh, the human environment, and that really led to countries around the world establishing departments of the environment, and that was when uh, Canada decided to create a department of the environment, and it was, it was really exciting, because environment was really, really important at that time, <laughs> uh, and, um, and since then, at least in Canada, it's become less and less and less important, and now um, uh, Canadian government scientists may not speak out <laughs> on environmental issues, especially on things like climate change, which of course uh, doesn't exist, because that would uh, interrupt the policy of uh, developing the oil sands in Alberta and so on. So things have really uh, gone downhill since then, but at that time it was a very vibrant uh, place to do research. And um, uh, Vit was in Ottawa uh, until about 1981, when the National Hydrology Research Institute was created within that department, uh, and he then moved out to Saskatoon, where that uh, part of the uh, Environment Canada is um, is still there. And in the 1980s, he became the chief scientist um, for water uh, in Environment Canada. Um, Kind of ironic, because he really did not fit in to the bureaucratic setting. He was always saying things which upset the bureaucrats, who were very rigid in their uh, way, of, way of thinking, and uh, illustrate that uh, uh, a little bit uh, later on. Now, um, <clears throat> in the late 80s, 87, uh, Vic became uh, president of IHS, and I believe Henny will be talking uh, more about uh, that period. And then uh, he left uh, Environment Canada in 1991, and in the, la- in the 10 years up to 2000, uh, he was a consultant in uh, British Columbia. <coughs> um, <coughs> I mentioned uh, this book this time, um, Common Sense and Other Heresies. You're not supposed to have common sense, <laughs> especially if you're... A, in Environment Canada as a research scientist. You're supposed to abide by all the rules and so on, which often are not demonstrating much common sense. Um, And this this book, if you don't know about it, was uh, was first published in 2000. And uh, you'll see that uh, edited by David Sellers. And David was in the same department, and he's almost exactly the same age as me. And in fact, I was good friends with him Uh, in the 70s, until he uh, went off to to, uh, British Columbia. So this book was first published by the Canadian Water Resources Association, and then after Viet's uh, death uh, a couple of years ago, uh, we decided (coughs) jointly that IHS and Canadian Water Resources Association should publish a second edition, and this is it. And it's uh, a collection of his seminal papers. Uh, So it's very well worth uh, uh, reading if you want to uh, refer to his uh, collection of papers. And it's available from the CWRA, Canadian Water Resources, Mm -hmm. website, and you can order it and and, um, Mm -hmm. obtain a copy. Um, I want to refer to one particular paper uh, in in this volume, the one which... uh, I chose as being most important or enlightening for me, and I'm sure that um, uh, Demetrius and others will be talking uh, about others, uh, other of his seminal papers. But um, before I do that, um, another little reminiscence. In, um, in 1988, um, IHS organized an international workshop on the hydrology of mountainous areas, and that's my uh, area of interest. And so I went to this conference, and Viet, as president of IHS at that time, uh, was also going to go. But if he went back to Czechoslovakia, he would immediately be put in prison, because he had, you know, left, uh, uh, he had escaped the country, 
And I believe, actually, that that escaping of the country must have really um, tempered the the way that he was thinking, you know, because he was uh, then sort of rejected by uh, the establishment in in Czechoslovakia after he had left. They didn't accept any of his papers and so on. Um, Anyway, uh, Witt was supposed to go to this conference. And um, if he went, he'd be put in jail. And this became a a diplomatic incident because you see there's also uh, United Nations agencies involved here. It's not just little IHS, but it's, you know, uh, big political players like UNESCO. And a complaint went from UNESCO uh, saying that if Witt, essentially if Witt is not allowed to go, um, uh, then we'll close the conference down, we'll close the workshop. And so Witt was given a special pass, I think for two weeks, that he could go for two weeks and he wouldn't be arrested as long as he left after, after two weeks. It was a, it was a, a very interesting uh, diplomatic uh, incident, if you like. And so that was in the uh, Tatra Mountains in uh, what is now uh, Slovakia. <clears throat> Well, let me just uh, quote one example of Witt's um, common sense uh, thinking. And this comes from the paper on uh, dilettantism uh, in hydrology. <clears throat> and uh, this is uh, a time series, a very short time series that he looked at. <clears throat> and um, we, we must ask, because we're at this workshop, is there stationarity in this, or is there other trends and so on? And um, referring back to Tahawarda's paper uh, yesterday, and to many other papers that you've given, uh, you must be very careful about uh, uh, fitting trends or curves to this sort of uh, data, and especially, as uh, Ronald Van Noyen uh, said, uh, you gave the arguments by, from Vic Clemish why you shouldn't make uh, projections into the future. Um, Anyway, um, you know, how can predictions, how can you make predictions based on such a short sample? How can can you justify that? And that's a question that we're still all uh, grappling with. Especially if uh, there may be uh, uh, trends in climate or changes in the regime of the river as a result of uh, human activities, building dams or cutting down forests or whatever. Um, <clears throat> and this uh, particular example was a, a little catchment where uh, it was very little affected uh, by human activity, um, but still it, it was extremely interesting. And um, one must also point out, and this is something that uh, Witt did very carefully, that the flood events on this river have several different origins. Well, first of all, this uh, hurricane hazel, which is at the beginning, it should never really have happened. I mean, it, it's very, very unusual, an extreme uh, rainfall event. But those uh, other events are not all rainfall events. Some of them are snowmelt events, and some of them are a combination of rain on snow. And some of the snowmelt events, as in uh, much of Canadian hydrology, are influenced by the state of the ground underneath. And very often at the end of winter, especially if at the beginning of winter there's very little snow, but it's very cold, the ground becomes frozen, and um, infiltration is essentially not allowed. <laughs> Um, and the runoff is, is much faster from snowmelt. That happened a couple of years ago in Manitoba. There was a really catastrophic flood, and it was a, a major cause of it was that the ground was not yet uh, uh, thawed, and uh, runoff was there was very little infiltration. So um, Viet uh, suggested that you split the sample into events of the same cause. And actually it struck me yesterday, listening to um, the the presentations, that very little was said about that. 
very little was said about the origin, the differing origin of floods. And presumably, floods with different origin have perhaps very different return periods and so on. So I'd I'd like uh, a bit of discussion on that, if if it's possible, that um, you shouldn't just um, fit curves to a set of data like this without first identifying the origins of, of, of particular events. Okay, that was um, the, the piece of common sense, if you like, which opened my eyes and opened many other people's eyes, that sort of uh, simple uh, but very important uh, way of thinking, uh, thinking very critically and not just a fitting uh, mindless curves uh, to, to, to sets of, of data. <clears throat> Now, I thought I would... um, Oh, yes, we've done that one. I thought I would uh, go back and illustrate... And I I think Demetrius is going to illustrate from the same um, set of slides um, the wonderful presentation that Viet gave in Perugia uh, at the IHS Assembly in 2007. So I thought I would clip out a few examples from that uh, wonderful and thought-provoking, very simple, (laughs) yet very pertinent um, uh, presentation that that Viet gave. And he is essentially looking at trees and tree rings as as data. And um, he decided to have a load of data, these trees, um, delivered to him so that he could do some some analysis on, on the data and there are many, many slides which I'm not going to show, but, for instance, he was you know, checking for non-linearities uh, uh, in the data, and um, he was you know, doing log transformations uh, of, of, of the data, um, and then he was checking for self-similarity and looking both at large tree trunks and twigs and looking at for scale invariance of self similarity and pointing out that this has not been uh, uh, developed as, even on the internet you know you don't get these kind of uh, comparisons which are really quite important and if the sample is too big then you have to uh, split it and here he's using some of his hardware uh, to do that and um, as I said a, a moment a few moments ago it might be useful to, to, to split the data into different segments. You know, on the left you might have uh, snowmelt-induced floods and on the right you might have rainfall-induced floods and you, you treat them separately. This was, these are his ideas. And he, he goes on and on and on uh, with very interesting uh, progressions of looking at the data. But eventually he comes round to uh, configuring the hardware for for um, uh, for, for putting the data in to to uh, manipulate it and use it, and uh, afterwards, of course, this is the data processing uh, during the winter, and he's very happy that uh, he's accomplished something with with, with uh, using the data in this way. Well, uh, those were some of my reminiscences of uh, Viet. Um, A very modest man, but um, a man with very high principles. He he didn't tolerate fools lightly (laughs) and uh, treated many of the rather high bureaucrats within his department (laughs) essentially as fools for the way that they were doing analysis, which didn't endear them to him. Uh, a man of great principle and a man of uh, really great determination, quiet determination. So um, those were my reminiscences and um, I guess we're now handing it back to uh, Demetrius to take us on further. Thank you.